I watched my wife Amy, to whom I had been married for three years, in the arms of a high-society snob named, believe it or not, Reginald, whom she dated before she married me. I've done a couple of smart things in the past. Now I needed to do something smart, too. However, since I didn't have a camera, my cell phone was being repaired, I only watched as the hug turned into cheating. Amy and I were supposed to be at her dad's house for dinner in less than an hour, and I knew that by the time I got my camera out, this photo shoot would be over. However, since Reginald's car was blocking Amy's, I could cause them a little trouble and get a little revenge while still being smart. Wearing gloves for all my related endeavors, I quickly unscrewed the valves on three of his tires, deflated them, and then revalved them. I took a rubber hammer from the garage and waited behind a bush. Reginald hurried out of the house a few minutes later. As he swore and knelt by his right front tire, I sneaked up and hit him on the head with a rubber mallet. I didn't hit him hard enough to kill him, but hard enough to incapacitate him. I took the car keys out of Reginald's pocket and threw them as far as possible into the bushes next to our house. Since I was a center fielder in high school and two years in college, the keys flew far enough away that they would never be found. I took the credit cards, driver's license, and cash out of his wallet. Who would have thought that a rich snob would carry no more than $28 in cash? I then wiped a small amount of hair, skin, and blood off the hammer with a rag soaked in bleach, returned the hammer to the garage, and placed the rag in a plastic bag. Credit cards and driver's licenses joined the rag in the bag. With the plastic bag in my hand, I ran to my car, which was parked several hundred meters away so Reginald couldn't see it, and drove at high speed to my father-in-law's expensive old house. One of the few working payphones left in America was at the 7-Eleven on the way to me. I parked at a nearby store, took off my jacket, put on a nondescript baseball cap, a sweatshirt, and mirrored sunglasses, then headed to the phone. I gave a teenage girl leaving Reginald's 28 bucks to call 911 and anonymously report a man lying in the driveway of 15 Ridgeway Terrace. I threw the plastic bag containing the rag, credit cards, and driver's license into the dumpster at the 7-Eleven. Then I drove to Dear Daddy's house, arriving 10 minutes ahead of schedule. As you can already tell, I didn't really like Daddy Dearest. He liked me, sort of but only because I was the best employee at the big insurance company he owned. That is, he liked the money I earned him. Daddy Dearest, his name is Chester Grimes, was and still is a rich pompous ass who always thought Amy was too pretty to marry a middle-class guy like yours, truly, Blake Bristol. In fact, based on morals rather than money, I was too good for Amy and Chester. Chester valued efficiency so I called Amy on Chester's landline to find out why she wasn't home at the scheduled time. She was exhausted and scared when she answered the phone. Hello, Amy. Where are you? Your dad is a little angry. Oh, well, uh, well, sorry, I'm late. Uh, well, uh, there was a crime in front of our house, and the police are here. Yes, officer. This is my husband, Blake. No, you don't need to talk to him, do you? I heard some arguing in the background, and apparently Amy had her hand over the phone. I heard the phone changing hands then. This is Detective Burns. Is this Blake Bristol? Yes, officer, what happened? Is my wife okay? Yes, Mr. Bristol, she's physically fine. However, a man named Reginald Swifton was attacked in your driveway and was taken away in an ambulance, with his car just now being towed away. What the hell was Reginald Swifton doing in my fucking house? I shouted in indignation, loud enough for the always correct Chester Grimes to hear. Your wife didn't really explain this to us. Perhaps you have some information about this. What the hell? He's her ex-boyfriend. Maybe he was just stopping by for a quickie. How the hell should I know? I hope they get the crap kicked out of him. From this asshole. No need to be vulgar, Mr. Bristol. So you don't know anything about why he might have been in your house or who attacked him? No. But when you find this guy, tell him I'd like to buy him a beer. Can you take my wife to the hospital and take a swab to prove they had sex? Not unless she wants to go, Burns replied. What if it was rape and she's too afraid to tell you? Can't you force her to take the test under these circumstances? I asked feverishly. Unless she says she was sexually assaulted, I'm sorry, but I can't, Burns replied. 
Could you at least take detailed photographs of her to show whether she was attacked? For example, are there any bruises or bleeding? I begged. Yes, we can do that, Burns replied. Thank you. Could you please put a potential crime victim back on the phone, Detective Burns? Yes, although I would like to talk to you a little more tomorrow. By then, my cell phone will be returned to me. Call me then to make an appointment and I will come to you, I told him, and then gave him my cell phone number. Hi, Blake, honey, Amy began to say. Stop talking nonsense, Amy. I want you to go to the hospital immediately, have Detective Burns take you, and have a swab taken to see if Reginald raped you. No, no. Where did you get this idea, Blake? Well then, go and prove to me that you didn't have sex with him. How can you accuse me of treason at such a moment? Amy cried. What time is it? So the bastard got attacked. I don't give a damn about him, and you shouldn't either. I shouted, then paused for emphasis before continuing. Let's do this, honey. Either you get swabbed and the police will witness it before you clean yourself up, or I file for divorce. Fuck you, she screamed, but before she could say anything else, I hung up. Chester was deathly pale and angry. What was it? He roared. Well, Chet, I replied. He hated being called Chet. Your daughter cheated on me with that asshole Reginald Swifton, so I'm divorcing her. When Chester recovered from the shock, he muttered, You can't talk to me like that or talk about my daughter like that. I have to fire you. The phone rang. I knew it was Amy, so I just picked it up and then threw it back. Could you put this in writing? I asked excitedly, taking a pen and notepad from the kitchen table and handing it to him. Even if it breaks my heart. If I don't make any more money for a pompous man like you, I'll somehow survive being fired. Chester faltered a bit, including muttering something about how shamelessly ungrateful I was and how glad he would be to get rid of me, as he wrote, Blake Bristol fired as of today, dated and signed with his name. Thank you, I said, and then walked out the door, clutching my pink paper to my chest as my ringing phone provided the background music. Okay, I know you're a little confused by my actions and think I might be crazy. Perhaps a little more information will help clear things up. The two smart things I referred to at the beginning were the terms of the prenuptial agreement Amy and I had, and the employment contract with Chester's company, signed at the same time as the prenuptial agreement. I got Amy and Chester to agree to add one clause to each of these contracts. I entered into a marriage contract on a mutual basis. That is, if either of us physically harms the other or has sex with anyone else during the marriage, then the sanctions specified in the marriage contract will come into play. In my case, I would receive $500,000 from her trust fund before we split our remaining assets 50-50. In her case, she would receive 85% of the assets. If there were children, fortunately we didn't have any, the injured party would have a receive custody. I have never even touched Amy in anger, and I have never cheated on her despite all the opportunities to do so. With respect to my employment contract, if I was fired or demoted in a manner that reduced my earnings or responsibilities by 10% or more, the non-competitive provisions of my employment contract were void. I was not in the best position to divorce Amy for infidelity and get what was due under the prenuptial agreement because I did not have photographs or records that would constitute definitive proof. However, I suspected her for a year, and collected a significant amount of admissible evidence. That is, I really had indirect evidence of her betrayal long before the incident with Reginald. My friend and middle-class lawyer, Ron Botts, told me that the circumstantial evidence gave me a good chance if we found the right judge, and that we could probably gather some more useful information during the investigation. Ron also advised me on what to do and what not to do regarding my imminent divorce. I have been advised to avoid closing accounts, transferring money or securities, canceling credit cards, etc., until we get a court order to maintain records and freeze assets. To act rashly would look bad in the eyes of the judge and would be detrimental to our case. As soon as I left Chester with steam pouring out of my ears, I bought a burner cell phone and called Ron's office. Why are you still there at 7 a.m. on Friday? I asked. 
Serving helpless assholes like you? He laughed in response. What's happened? I explained the situation to him, but only from the moment I got to Chester's house. Ron had simple advice. Don't come home tonight. Go to the hotel, get receipts, and be seen on their CCTV cameras. Tomorrow morning, a police officer with a video camera will escort you back home and leave the recording device there. In the meantime, I'll check on Reginald. I will begin divorce proceedings on Monday. I did as I was told. The next morning, Saturday, the policeman and I went to my house where Reginald had sex. I entered the side door and then into the living room. I made a fuss and shouted, Amy, I'm here to pick up some things and then leave. Amy quickly went down the stairs. Why the hell do you start accusing me of cheating and forcing my father to fire you? You ass. Did you take a vaginal smear? I asked sarcastically. Hell no. She started screaming before I cut her off. Then we have nothing to talk about. I'll take my clothes and leave. She was so focused on telling me off that I'm sure Amy didn't see it. But he did get good photos and videos of her face and exposed skin that showed no cuts or bruises. I closed and locked the bedroom door and, ignoring her knocking and screams, packed my clothes and valuables into two suitcases. I checked the sheets for stains, but she was smart enough to change them. She probably burned them or soaked them in bleach. After gathering my things, I walked past her without saying a word and out the front door. I filmed her with my telephoto lens from the car as she screamed on the porch outside as I left. While Amy and I were upstairs, he installed a long battery recorder in the kitchen. How did the photos and videos turn out? I asked when we drove away. Fine. It's easy to see that there were no marks on her. Placing a voice-activated voice recorder turned out to be a brilliant solution. Later that day, we overheard her talking to one of her friends, Lila Castle. Amy forced Lila to hit her in the face and arms and cause small cuts to her arms and neck. After Lila did what Amy asked, they both went to the clinic to document the cuts and bruises and take pictures. While Amy and Lila were at the clinic, the private investigator and I returned to my house to pick up all the other things I needed and to pick up the recorder. Ron called it perfect. On Monday, we filed a lawsuit for adultery. By the end of the week, Amy had filed a counterclaim for physical abuse. Around the time Amy was filing for divorce on Monday, after I had cleaned out my office and picked up my cell phone from the repair shop, I went to see Detective Burns. Where were you when the Reginald Swifton thing happened, Mr. Bristol? This was his first question after exchanging pleasantries. It sounds like you're treating me like a suspect, I said, crossing my arms over my chest. Well, we do have evidence linking you to the scene, he continued. Well, then you should arrest me because I'm done talking to you and I want to invite my lawyer, I said decisively. Of course, I knew he didn't have any proof. Is this really how you want to play it out? You will look guilty, Burns continued. I thought that when I asked for a lawyer, you wouldn't be able to ask me another question, but you just did. Either arrest me or I'm leaving, I said. I stood up and headed towards the door. We're not done yet, Burns continued without any boasting. Only with my lawyer, I said, handing him one of Ron's business cards and leaving. I never heard from him again, and neither did Ron. I do wish that, at the time the suit and counterclaim were filed, I had been aware of Ron's conversation with another private investigator, Dan Drake, who was also a friend of Ron's. My anxiety would have been greatly eased, and I would have understood Ron's unshakable confidence in our cause. The conversation between Ron and Dan took place two days after the counterclaim was filed. Ron only told me about this after the trial. Dan, I don't want you to tell me anything of substance that you know, but I need answers to a couple of questions. Damn it, Ron. If I can help, I will, Dan replied. Dan, does the name Amy Bristol mean anything to you? Yes, it is. Do you have any clients for whom you work that are interested in Amy Bristol's activities? Yes, they were, Ron. Can you tell me their names? I'll contact them and call you back, Ron. Dan called Ron a few hours later. Their names are Elizabeth Moore and Jamie Watkins, and... Don't tell me anything else, Dan. Would any clients want you to oversee a divorce case in which Amy Bristol is a party? Ha <laughs> ha. Okay, Ron. Yes, I'm sure at least one of them will. I'll tell you the date, Dan. Thank you. Ron finished. 
While this conversation was happening, I was apparently interviewing with Chester's biggest competitor, who hired me at the same salary that Chester's company was paying me and with a commission almost twice as much. Since there was no way for me not to compete with Chester's company, I contacted all of my old clients within a week, and within a month, almost 90% of them had transferred their business to my new company. I could afford to pay Ron's and the private investigator's bills. Additionally, between the start of the divorce process and the trial date, more than 80% of the time, I beat Chester's company for new business when we met face to face. Ron filed for an asset freesy when he filed for divorce. This was satisfying. Neither Amy nor I could touch our money except for attorney's fees and other court costs, an award granted by the court or as a result of a special request that the other party either agreed to or ordered by the court. There were no cash-outs, cancellations of credit cards, transfers of money from joint accounts to individual accounts, sales of shares, cancellation of insurance policies or rating of safe deposit boxes. I thought the appointment of a judge was unfortunate, but Ron assured me that it would be good for us in the long run. Judge Matt Moore presided. He was the newest and youngest judge on the family court. He was very energetic, confident, and handsome, with a suspicious prejudice against us. I met Matt Moore just once, at a Fourth of July party at his next-door neighbor's house about a month before he was confirmed as a judge. I remember because Amy and I had a fight that night because she got drunk and disappeared from me. Moore spoke very highly of my father-in-law, Chester Grimes, in a brief conversation Moore and I had that evening. I asked Ron, why did we forego a jury trial if you suspect that because of his relationship with Chester Grimes, Moore is prejudiced against us? Ron just smiled. Who is the lawyer here, you or me? I know what I'm doing. I want to get for you more than what is provided for in the marriage contract, he answered very confidently. Ron explained the pre-trial procedure to me. During the investigation, we would have to reveal what we knew and use it as evidence. The only exception was that if something would be used only for impeachment, that is, to call into question the credibility of a witness or a party, then we did not have to disclose the evidence or any witness who would present it. Ron did not tell me about his conversation with Dan Drake. And in fact, he did not have any discoverable information based on that conversation, which is why it was not disclosed to Amy's lawyer, Amanda McAfee, earlier. When we answered Amy's attorney's questions under oath, it was not surprising that Lila Castle was brought forward as a witness to my alleged attack on Amy. It was alleged that the attack happened on the Saturday after the incident with Reginald, when the private investigator and I came to my house to pick up my things. Ron immediately noticed Lila's testimony before we had to respond to Amy's inquiries about the attack. Lila's videotape testimony, which Amy and I both attended although we never spoke to each other, took place on Monday. After Ron pointed out the date of the alleged attack to Lila, he struck. So, Miss Castle, you are absolutely certain that you witnessed the attack shortly before you accompanied Mrs. Bristol to the clinic for treatment that Saturday, correct? Yes, I'm sure, she said, trying to look confident, but she couldn't. You didn't injure Mrs. Bristol yourself, did you? Ron continued. Lila and Amy's jaws dropped, and Amanda McAfee looked puzzled. Of course not, Lila answered hesitantly. I am going to play for you an audio recording that an independent witness swears was recorded on that Saturday after Mr. Bristol left his home. Tell me, do you recognize these voices? When Ron played the tape, everyone on the other side of the table turned ashen gray. When this was done, Ron asked, do you recognize the voices? Aren't you and Mrs. Bristol talking about giving her a bruise and then lying about how Mr. Bristol did it? You must have set this up, Lila sobbed. We'll have a voice expert compare your voice in today's testimony with what's on the tape, and then we'll send the case to the prosecutor's office for perjury charges. These are all the questions I have. Not surprisingly, Amy's lawyer had no objection. Two days after Lila's testimony, Amanda McAfee decided to withdraw the counterclaim and asked the court to enter a consultation order to stay the case for two months until the parties seek the services of a certified conciliation mediator. Ron strongly opposed this proposal. During oral arguments, he said, Your Honor, 
they filed the counterclaim in bad faith, and we want to be able to put that on the record at trial because it undermines Mrs. Bristol's credibility. Moreover, my client has no interest in reconciliation, and until the case is closed, he loses interest on the $500,000 he intends to recover from Mrs. Bristol. In a show of bias, Judge Moore granted Amy's motion but threw us a bone. If reconciliation fails and Mr. Bristol prevails in court, then Mrs. Bristol will pay two months interest at the rate of 4% per annum on any money to which Mr. Bristol is entitled, in addition to the division of assets. Ron warned me to follow the instructions in the order during the conciliation process so as not to give the court any reason to sanction me. He told me not to swear, no matter how much I wanted to. Is the word bitch a curse word? I asked him. No, but don't use it. Call her a blatantly unfaithful wife? Ron replied with a smile. Not surprisingly, two days before my scheduled counseling session, I received an email from Chester Grimes. I refused to answer his phone calls or even listen to his messages. The letter was very conciliatory and offered me a return to my old job with double my salary and commission. I saved it in case Ron could use it as evidence, but I never responded to it. Lawyers were not allowed to attend the consultation, only the parties. Amy arrived for her counseling session dressed to kill. She is a sexy, sensual woman, and her wardrobe, makeup, and hair were impeccable. If I didn't hate her, I would gladly engage in her pleasure. Since the order said nothing about clothing, I showed up in cut-off jeans, sandals, and an old college t-shirt with holes in it. Amy hated the shirt and tried to throw it away twice. Plus, I hadn't shaved in two days, and my hair was disheveled and unwashed. Amy took one look at me and knew it was over, but she tried anyway, no doubt motivated by only $500,000. Mr. Bristol, I'm surprised by your appearance, said the consultant. The order didn't say anything about clothing, and that's how I decided to show up. I'm sorry if this doesn't meet with your approval, I replied, trying to avoid a sarcastic tone but probably failing. The mediator then resumed the session, while Amy and I remained silent. Even though I was the applicant, she allowed Amy to speak first. Can't I, as the plaintiff, speak first? I asked. As a mediator, I can determine the order of the discussion, he retorted, obviously still disturbed by my appearance. Amy was a great actress. She told me how much she loved me and wondered why I was suspicious of her. She talked about all the wonderful times we had together and cried where it was appropriate for dramatic effect. This took a good half hour. Either the mediator was moved by Amy's performancy or he was trying to settle the matter, because as soon as Amy finished, she turned to me with misty eyes and said, Mr. Bristol, what would you like to say to your dear wife, who has just bared her soul? She's not such a good wife. She is a serial cheater and has been grossly unfaithful to me, as well as a liar, as her story of me beating her clearly shows. Her entire performance was an act in an attempt to save $500,000. I don't know if she ever loved me, but I don't care. I don't love her. In fact, I hate her, and I want to get a divorce as quickly as possible so I can move on with my life. The mediator and Amy were shocked. During the remainder of the session, I briefly answered questions or responded to statements from both the counselor and Amy. The only response of more than four words I gave for the rest of the session was when a tearful Amy said, you didn't even give me a chance to explain why Reginald was there before you freaked out. Then I told you, in no uncertain terms, to take a swab to prove you didn't have sex with him, or to accuse him of rape, and that if you didn't, I would divorce you. It was your choice. Live with it. It was not received very well. As a last, desperate gesture, the mediator said, Mr. Bristol, I want you to stand up, Go to Amy and hug her to see if this awakens any feelings in you. I quickly replied, I didn't see any requirement in the order that I had to hug her, and the thought of even touching my flagrantly unfaithful future ex-wife gives me goosebumps. Since I don't want to lose my breakfast, I decline. Amy jumped out of her chair, started swearing at me as loudly as she could, 
and probably would have hit me if the mediator hadn't intervened. While the mediator was trying to calm Amy down, the big smile on my face probably wasn't helping the situation. The mediator said, You can go, Mr. Bristol. The mediator informed the court that there was no hope of reconciliation, so the court lifted the moratorium and the proceedings continued. During the hearing, Amy's lawyer took a statement from me. I answered all her questions truthfully, except two. They were, Did you ever actually witness Mrs. Bristol having sex with another man before filing for divorce? And, Did you ever see Reginald Swifton in your home while you were married and before filing for divorce? Basically, I'm honest but not stupid. After several months of pre-trial proceedings, during which Judge Moore demonstrated his bias whenever possible while still defending the record for appeal, the trial was scheduled for two months after the trial was adjourned. Ron didn't testify to Amy. For strategic reasons, he told me. However, he had Amy's answer during interrogations, where she swore that she had never had sex with another man during the marriage and before filing for divorce. During the trial, we presented our circumstantial evidence of adultery by three o'clock on the first day, because we had sufficient evidence to deny the motion for directed verdict. Despite how biased Moore was, he knew his decision would be overturned on appeal if he granted it. Now it is the defendant's turn to present her side of the story. Of course, Amy's main witness was Amy herself. Under oath, Amy denied ever having sex with another man while she was married. Judge Moore looked a little embarrassed at one point, but for the most part he ate out of her hand and overruled almost all of Ron's objections. When she finished, it was almost five o'clock, so Judge Moore ordered the hearing to continue at nine the next morning. As we were gathering up our papers to leave, a guy walked up to Ron with a big smile on his face. When Ron saw him, he smiled back. I saw this guy sitting in the courtroom during Amy's testimony, but I didn't know who he was. Blake, this is Dan Drake, my friend, Ron said. I shook Drake's hand with a puzzled expression on my face. I have some information for you, Ron, Drake said, his smile growing even wider. This is due to the refutation of Amy Bristol's testimony. Let's go to my office and order dinner, Ron chuckled as the three of us walked out. In Ron's office, Drake showed us one DVD of Amy Naked satisfying James Watkins. Drake said he had another DVD, but Ron stopped him from showing it to us. I just want you to testify about the release date of your second DVD. If this is what I think, but I don't know for sure. I don't want to see it now, and I'm sure it will never be shown in court. At precisely nine o'clock the next morning, Ron began his interrogation of Amy. After asking her about Reginald's visit on the day I witnessed them having sex, he asked, Do you know a man named James Watkins? Yes, she answered hesitantly. And his wife, Jamie Watkins? Yes. When did you first meet him? I do not remember exactly. Wasn't it at a party at your father's house 18 months ago when he came there with his wife Jamie? Maybe. Didn't he move to town and start working for your father a month before? I guess so. Well, was it like that or wasn't it? Should we call him or Mrs. Jamie Watkins to testify? Ron growled, his pleasant demeanor suddenly disappearing. After an awkward pause, Amy stammered and said, Yes, now I remember. It was at that party about a year and a half ago that I first met him. So you never met him before you got married, did you? No, Amy answered hesitantly. Mrs. Bristol, have you ever had sex with Mr. James Watkins? No, no. You keep accusing me of cheating, Amy whined and then burst into tears. Your Honor, at this time I would like to play the DVD. Due to its nature, I request that it only be displayed on the monitors at the lawyer's tables, in the dock, and in the witness box, and not on the main courtroom monitor. Very good, Mr. Botts. Bailiff, please push the right buttons to make this happen, Judge Moore said. After a pause and a nod from the bailiff, Ron pressed play on the DVD player. Amy screamed and then covered her mouth when she saw what appeared on the screen. Is this video of you and Mr. Watkins having sex, Mrs. Bristol? Ron asked after he had played about 60 seconds. No, no, no. It's a fake copy. 
turn it off, Amy sobbed. There are no further questions, Your Honor. If the defendant has no questions, I would like to call Dan Drake to testify. No questions, Amanda McAfee said, wincing as Amy left the witness stand in tears. However, I have an objection. This video was never provided to us during the investigation and should not be used for any purpose. Actually, Your Honor, I only found out about this around 7 o'clock last night, but that doesn't matter. The DVD and the testimony of Mr. Dan Drake, who will attest to its authenticity, are being used only to refute Mrs. Bristol's testimony and not for any other purpose. Judge Moore was uncomfortable, but he had no choice. The objection is rejected. With proper authentication, I will allow the DVD to be used for rebuttal purposes only. Dan Drake was a confident and unflappable witness. After Ron made everyone aware of his qualifications, he confirmed the authenticity of the DVD, explaining that he filmed the video at the home of Mr. and Mrs. Watkins with the permission of his client, Mrs. Jamie Watkins. It showed James Watkins and Amy Bristol having sex while she was married to Blake Bristol and before the divorce papers were filed. Judge Moore now looked extremely confused, especially when Ron asked Drake, do you have another video of Mrs. Bristol having sex with another married man while she was married to Mr. Bristol? Yes, Drake answered affirmatively. What is the release date for this video, Mr. Drake? July 4, 2012, Drake answered, looking directly at Judge Moore. Judge Moore interrupted. I need to meet with the lawyers and parties in my office right now. When we entered the courtroom, the judge took off his robe and sat down thoughtfully. Finally, he spoke. Miss McAfee, your client Mrs. Bristol appears to have committed perjury. I may be required to bring this to the attention of the district attorney and, of course, comment on it if I write an opinion. I'm going to adjourn the trial for 24 hours. I suggest that you negotiate a settlement during this time. Amy looked down at the floor and Amanda McAfee looked shocked but resigned. If you don't do this, you won't like what happens next. Moore continued. Unless someone has a very compelling reason to present additional evidence, I rule that the testimony in this case is sealed. I will also file a motion to have the record sealed. By four o'clock that day, Amy had written me a check for $500,000 plus interest, paid all of Ron's fees and disbursements, and signed a document agreeing to the divorce and giving me 60% of our assets, rather than the 50% specify it in the prenuptial agreement. That extra 10% was just my little bonus. In exchange, we settled the case with prejudice, promised not to bring Amy's perjury to the attention of the DA, and filed a joint petition for dissolution of marriage due to irreconcilable differences and sealed the record. That same day, Judge Moore excitedly approved the settlement, granted the divorce petition, and sealed the record. When Ron a few others from his office, Dan Drake and, surprisingly, Jamie Watkins, and I, went out to dinner to celebrate that evening, I whispered a question to Ron. Why was Moore so insistent that this case be completed and the protocol sealed? Of course, I don't really know anything about this. Ron grinned. Otherwise, as a judicial officer, I would have to file a motion to remove Moore and report it to the Ethics Commission. However... I'm willing to bet he had a personal interest in the matter, Ron said, his grin now turning truly devilish. After thinking for a few seconds, I decided that I didn't need to ask any further questions. Four months later, I read that Judge Matt Moore and his wife Elizabeth Moore had been granted a divorce due to irreconcilable differences. The details weren't made public, but I noticed that while driving around town, Judge Moore was now driving a five-year-old Ford, whereas when I met him at a July 4th party in 2012, he was driving a new Mercedes. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.